Why? Hello and welcome everybody. Also, good morning. So today, uh, I wanted to go ahead and help you guys out with a top 10 tips for newer players playing Righteous Fire Juggernaut, specifically for the Forbidden Sanctum League for 3.20. Now, before I get started, if you're unaware, I do have a website specifically designed for Righteous Fire. It's got loads of questions. It, got, it has all my POBs, tips for crafting, etc. So don't forget to check this out. But this video is not going to be dedicated for that. This video is going to be talking about my top 10 tips. So, tip number one. Um, a lot of players still are concerned running Righteous Fire. It's really daunting trying to set it up without a build guide, for example. But have no fear, Juggernaut is here. You can easily set up Righteous Fire at simply getting to level 35 on a Juggernaut and ascending and taking the Unbreakable Ascendancy, or sorry, the Untiring, not Unbreakable, this one right here. This gives us a 40% increased life regeneration rate which scales fantastically with sources of flat life regen, such as your stone golem, your vitality, uh, and then just flat regeneration on gear. Coupled with the skill tree, you'll be at 79 fire res by the time you're level 35, and you should be able to get rolling. If you're a little bit more concerned because you're playing hardcore, you could wait a few extra levels till around level 40, and the reasoning for this is because your stone golem and your vitality will level up, and they're going to outscale the pace at which you gain health so as you level up, you will literally feel stronger because of your regeneration scaling. All right, number two, since we're still in the leveling, I'm kind of making these sort of sequential. Um, since Juggernaut is primarily red, right? I mean, just think about it. Juggernaut is red. He stacks strength. He's a pure life build. The problem is, is we're like a caster. We're stacking a lot of blue gems. So to alleviate this during the campaign, we're going to be looking for armor energy shield gear. It still gives us a meaningful level of armor while still allowing us to get a majority of blues on our sockets. So our Righteous Fire is blue, the support gems we use are blue, our Flammability Curse is blue, our Frost Blink is blue, the Hex Touch setup is blue, um, you know, our Combustion Link for our Fire Trap is blue. You get the point, there's a lot of blue gems, right? So this will help a lot. Also, if you guys are following my build, don't forget you can use the filter command in my stream, which will bring up my loot filter that you can follow as well, so that when you're leveling through the campaign, it will highlight some of these. Furthermore, um, when you get higher level, this is not necessarily too big of a deal, but um, another thing you can do is use the Verici socket trick. So what the Verici socket trick is, is essentially if you have a piece of gear, like say this scepter right here, right? So say I want this socket here to be red, but imagine this is on like a pure evasion piece or a pure dexterity piece. Uh, it would be really, really difficult to get this to be not necessarily the most difficult, but it would be difficult to try to manipulate the, the, the colors. Essentially, what I'm trying to say here in a very bad way is if you go to your bench, you can also use jeweler orbs as pseudo chromatics. So for example, when you're off coloring something, say you have the colors you want like here here and here but not here the way the jeweler method works is it will always pull the last socket off so now if i go to three socket right this three socket can actually hit red or blue it could hit green but you can just keep doing this to basically force it to be the next color now you can apply this to pretty much anything uh this is how i usually end up getting like four off colors on very odd pieces like your boots or your gloves uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much how that method works. It's very good when you essentially need need your colors now and you don't have chromatics slash off coloring. Number three, spell damage does not work for righteous fire. Uh, the reason why I bring so much emphasis to this is I think a lot of players get confused because righteous fire itself is a spell damage multiplier. What this means is, is it grants a massive multiplier. Oh, someone just donated on the website. Well, thank you, my dude. Uh, what this means is you gain a massive spell damage multiplier for your fire trap, but Righteous Fire does not gain any benefit from that spell damage itself. It's simply buffing your other spells, right? Instead of scaling spell damage, I would recommend looking for sources like fire damage, burning damage, Ellie damage, increased damage, minion damage because we take spiritual aid, Area damage, damage over time multiplier, fire damage over time multiplier, plus the gems, etc. Number four, spiritual aid. So, spiritual aid is a node that we take on the tree over here that states the following increases and reductions to minion damage also affect you. What this means is, is if you take a node like, say, 
10% increased minion damage. This is now 10% increased damage. That is a very, very, very good way to scale because increased damage is essentially a global modifier and works for everything. Now, because we're a damage over time build and we can't scale, for example, we're not scaling cast speed, critical chance, critical strike multiplier, penetration, increases are still very valuable to us up to a certain extent. So taking these nodes in conjunction with uh, Retribution, which is a 30% damage node, this actually puts us at about 15.2% damage per point and you get 1% life regen because of this node right here. As an example of how strong 15.2% damage is in the early game, this Ellie damage node is 12%. The entire Inquisitor start is 10, 10, 10, uh, 12, and then 14. Although you could go through here, but that doesn't matter because we're not really physical. Um, even if you were to look here at like Heart of Flame, these are 16, 16, 16, and 30. So this is technically better, but you have to path three points to it versus here there is no pathing. Also to uh, bring up to the next point, with Spiritual Aid, there is something kind of unique you can do in the early game. Um, this is like a bonus tip. When you are going through the campaign, oftentimes you'll find essences. So even with like lower tier versions of essences, like say uh, Screaming, Screaming is not like crazy low tier, but it's not crazy high tier. You can actually craft your scepters with uh, Screaming Essence of Fear or an above, right? So I'll give you an example of how this will work. You can simply click a modifier and you get 54% increased damage. And then, right, you can just go to your bench, and if you have done anything with Betrayal, you can actually craft Fire Damage Overtime Multiplier. What this does is this now just gave me a 54% increased damage scepter with 40% Ellie damage, so that's effectively 94%, and then you can also put Fire Multi. This is an excellent starting weapon we virtually crafted with nothing, right? So a weapon like this literally costs nothing and gets you rolling all the way till probably like late yellows, even early reds, and then you want to start looking for your plus gems. Okay, um, number five. So this one is not necessarily Righteous Fire specific, but it's something I notice a lot of people make mistakes on. After killing Katava in Act 10, when you get hit with your resistance penalty, you can actually go ahead and type slash passives. When you type slash passives, what it is going to do for you is it's actually going to pull up every single side quest in the game that offers you a passive point. Bandits also give you two passive points. So if you have completed all of them, you will have 24 passive skill points. DLDR, if you kill Katava in Act 10 and type slash passives, and it's not 22 or 24, 22 is if you have uh, helped the bandits, then you should go back and look. Also, you can just look if there's a zero here. That means you're missing free skill points, literally free. Sometimes players get upwards of 90 and they type slash passives and realize they're missing a point or two. Okay, so once we are into mapping, um, I wanna talk about a little bit about mapping. Um, so you guys have seen, I've done a lot of Righteous Fire showcases, but if you guys are unaware with how Righteous Fire works, I just wanna give you a basic understanding of the play style. So it's very simple. You're simply going to turn on your Righteous Fire. Right? So I like to put mine on my control key. Then you're just going to shield charge through. And the main focus here is whenever you find targets who are a bit tanky, right? You can either A, so like here's a here's a rare mom. A, you can throw a fire trap. B, you can actually frost blink to curse them. Even though the curses are going to be slightly weaker on rare mobs, it still is so much faster than just like standing there and doing nothing, right? So you have the option of fire trapping, you have the option of frost blinking, you have the option of doing both of them. Now against bigger packs, I don't think I have a shrine unfortunately, so I can't really show this, but against bigger packs, you can use your infernal cry, which will create a massive explosion. So like here is... Uh, here's like a blue pack. And there's the explosion. I think this is in SSF standard now. Yeah, it migrated from Calandra, so I don't have an Atlas at the moment. Oh, 20 minutes to go. Woo. Okay, let's go to the next point here. Um, as for what map mods you want to avoid, I would recommend avoiding minus max, less recovery. Although less recovery in, in white tier maps, remember that as your map modifier, as your map tier gets higher, you have white maps, yellow maps, and red maps. The modifiers that roll on the maps increase. 
So in the lowest tier in white maps, running less recovery is not really a big deal. Same thing with like less armor and reduced aura. It's not a big deal in the very early game. But as you get further, that your defenses are more, I would say, mandatory. You're much more reliant on them. Uh, so you don't really want to pull them, pull them down. No regeneration. Obviously, we're not going to run, but I think that only shows in red tier. All right, number seven. So number seven is kind of similar to um, number two in a sense. Number seven is essentially purely talking about Juggernaut's body armor. The reason why I bring this up is because six linking is a core part of Path of Exile, right? So normally I acquire mine through Chains That Bind. Um, I'm not necessarily going to tell you how to get the six link right away because most people, I would say a lot of people know this stuff, but divination cards can give you like a guaranteed six link. So you have like Chains That Bind, Emperor of Purity. Um, uh, I forgot there's a lot of other ones, but they usually get quite a bit more expensive. I think Celestial Justicar, for example, we're talking about just coloring the chest. So what I recommend is while you are crafting your chest, and crafting can be simple, right? Using some essences, uh, using a few chaos orbs, clicking harvest reforge. Um, it, it doesn't really matter, right? Especially when you're going for just a basic chest piece. But while you are crafting your chest piece, there is a chance, I believe it's on a suffix, you can get 16 or 32% reduced attribute requirement. Now, the reason why this is important is if I were to take off my chest piece right now, if you look at my chess piece, it says requires level 64, 145 strength. That strength right there is actually the weighting of your of your sockets to hit red. So if it, if it requires 145 strength and zero int and zero dex, it is primarily going to hit strength almost every time, which is red. Uh, so during the process of chroming it, or sorry, uh, crafting it, if you hit reduced attribute requirements, it will pull down that strength roll, uh, the strength requirement lower, thus making it easier to get your desired colors. So once you get that, what I would recommend doing next is A, you can directly chrome from the bench. That's what I do because I'm weird. I do believe it is cheaper and you can Google Verici uh, calculator for this. I do believe it is cheaper to come here and just do one blue socket. Your goal is to hit three off colors. So blue, 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 or blue, blue, green. Those both work. After you have your three off colors, your other three are gonna be red. You then will turn to your betrayal board, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So betrayal board, I think John is over here. And you wanna get Verici in research. For the most part, Verici is always on the standard board and I'm not gonna bring too much emphasis to this because it's not something you're probably doing on day one. Um, you want to get Verici in research. It really doesn't matter if he's the head or if he's one of these dudes. He doesn't have to be level three. You just want to try to get him in research and run the safe house. When you run the safe house, he'll give you an option to randomly recolor one of the sockets to at least one socket to white. The goal here, it's 50-50. Get one of your reds to turn white. That white socket can be used as a green or a blue and you're done. Voila, your chess piece is done for like the whole league. I know that's a lot to take in. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so that pretty much hits everything there. Number eight is gonna be cheap uniques. Now, cheap is subjective. They may be extremely expensive, but they are a very good bang for their buck. So for example, during the leveling phase when you're in the campaign and even in early maps, you've got Pyring, which gives loads of burning damage, very strong for your Righteous Fire Clear. You've got Kikizuru that gives you three times your level in HP regeneration, extremely good for the campaign, also gives, I think, like attributes, so very, very good in general. And Springleaf is just straight HP regen. You could actually run Righteous Fire at level 20 if you use uh, Kikizuru's and Springleaf if you choose to. Although your RF will be very small. Uh, maps. So once we're in maps, Immortal Flesh will literally be best in slot for 95% of people playing this build. The amount of regeneration it gives you is unrivaled unless you are going extremely expensive. The only time I would say players are not going to use an Immortal Flesh is when they are looking to stack like higher sources of chaos resistance. And Rise of the Phoenix is a pretty cheap go-to, although if it's too expensive, like, I don't know, even like 10 chaos, I would probably just ignore it. It's just gonna be something you can pick up for a couple of chaos on the side. If it's expensive, completely ignore it. Number nine, flasks. So flasks are an important part of, I would say almost any build in the game, specifically on Righteous Fire. And I wanna bring emphasis to these three flasks. The Ruby Flask mitigates righteous fire damage that you take. The ruby flask states 20% less fire damage taken. This means you take less from your RF, 
which means you're gaining more regeneration from your actual regeneration. Remember that if you open up your character sheet and you look at your life regen, that is not actually what you regenerate. That is simply stating the number that your character has before Righteous Fire is subtracting it. So utilizing something like a Ruby Flask not only mitigates the damage, but also makes it so that you get a bonus chunk of fire resistance. So say you're running a map and you get hit by flammability and then elemental weakness, and then the monster has fire exposure, and then you get hit by scorch, right? The Ruby Flask's bonus fire resist will try to help maintain that large chunk of resistances so that you don't get stripped down. Because fire is our most important, because if our if our fire res goes like 30%, all of a sudden we're degening like 2000 HP a second and you do not want that to happen. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Um, so a good suffix as well to hit on your flask, it doesn't have to be on the ruby, is increased armor. The Quicksilver is pretty self-explanatory. I like to map fast, so I personally always recommend a Quicksilver. Of course, you don't have to do this. We've got um, Granite Flask. Granite, I would say, is kind of bread and butter into the build. Uh, the reason I would call it bread and butter is mainly because uh, it gives you that chunk of armor. That chunk of armor synergizes really well with Juggernaut's Ascendancy, synergizes really well with um, Molten Shell to help keep you, you know, give you a larger Molten Shell bubble. 10k being the maximum, uh, and that's in the early game, it helps trivialize early physical damage. Now, going over more on the flasks, I want to talk about two other things. The ability to make them automatic, and some good suffixes, or not suffixes, uh, on top of that, uh, they gain charges. So I don't have the exact item level for them. Um, I had them in a previous video, but basically, I think if you have above item level 80 flasks, you can hit gain three charges, by the time you're mapping in your yellows, you're probably in like mid 70s or getting item level 70 plus flasks. I think 75 plus, you'll hit the gain two charges and gain one charge I think is around early mapping. Uh, two charges is honestly like enough for most stuff. Like I don't even have three charges on any of these. To give you an example of what this charge generation is gonna look like, I'm gonna go ahead and just run into a quick spot here, turn off my Tempest Shield as it's literally going to kill the monsters. Here you can see my Ruby Flask. Uh, right, let's try that again. Here you can see my Ruby Flask automatically goes off. You can see the charge generation gain on it. I'm not pressing anything, right? Then, when you have that charge generation, you can go over to your crafting bench, located right over here, and you can type full. Yeah, use when charges reach full. The combination of getting hit and then having your flasks automatically go off is a great quality of life for mapping. Now, in the League mechanic, you probably don't want to soak up a bunch of damage, but that's totally fine, because you could always just press your flask as well. This is mainly just mapping quality of life. Okay, next up, I kind of have a big one, Betrayal. I am going to do my best and summarize Betrayal and show you in the easiest manner possible. It's not going to talk about min-maxing, it's not going to talk about the complexity, it's simply talking about getting gear to get started with your unveils. So with that being said, let me show you. So what I do early league is I personally like to go into uh, focused investigation here and then the little baby node here. And then I typically branch up here. This part's not super important. I like to grab my uh, covert stakeouts for master mission chance to be done. Then I come down over here and I grab this whole wheel. The most important thing here is bribery. Immortal syndicate members in your maps are 200% more likely to offer to bargain for items. So. Let me just jump back into this map and show you how I do Betrayal. Now, there are lots of content creators such as like Subtractum uh, who have very detailed Betrayal guides, but we're not going into that. We're just getting into getting your toes wet, just starting off Betrayal and getting some gear. No safe house, min-max, none of that stuff. Oh, you know, it would actually be a lot easier to do Betrayal if I put my Righteous Fire Gem back. We're just going to kill them with Fire Trap real fast. Okay, so in an instance here, I have three dudes, Elrion, Haku, and Gravicious. Do you want to know the difference between all of them? In our current build, literally nothing. It doesn't matter. I promise, ignore it. People tell you, you're just trying to get gear right now. So, uh, here in an instance, you can either interrogate, execute, release. I'm going to interrogate to build up the favor here so I can run this safe house later. That right there, drop the belt. We're going to pick that up and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Haku. 
Uh, Haku becomes the leader of intervention. Haku and Gravicious become rivals. That's pretty good. Um, execute, interrogate, release. So if we look at Haku here, betray. Let's real fast just go to our, our tree here. So we're trying to go for bargain because bargain gives us the items. However, betray also gives us the ability for them to become rivals. In a situation like this, I'll be honest, I don't necessarily know what's best, but I'm looking for bargain. So what I'm going to do real quickly is I'm simply going to interrogate you, click Haku, and now I have bargain. I click bargain and it drops loot. Now, if you have that node selected, there's a good chance you get even more loot, but we don't have that selected right now, right? So let's go ahead and unveil. Oh, hey, look, here's a random piece that I have already from random unveiling. Uh, right, so nothing here necessarily really matters. That was the Katarina piece. So the reason why I talk about this is you can get early plus two gems. In helmets and gloves, you can get plus two to socketed AoE gems. Getting plus two to socketed AoE gems allows you to as instantly essentially get a pseudo five link. So in an instance like this, we have life regen. I don't really care about this. And we also have a belt here. This belt, I'll tell you what we're hoping for. It would be chaos resistance suffix. So unveil and oh, wow, I actually didn't get lucky. That was a pretty bad showcase. In that case, let's go ahead and go into uh, this research right over here. Do a nice little showcase again. And again, with the bribery nodes allocated, it would be much better, but we don't have that at the moment. I just want to show you guys how simple betrayal can be if you just take it at face value. And then maybe you decide you want to investigate it a little bit further and you min-max it a little bit further, right? But I completely agree in a sense where it does suck when PoE has so much bloat that it's a little difficult for you to understand where to start. So here I'm just going to execute and Rin has bargain. And we got no loot. That was uh, pretty unlucky. Make make sure you actually have your nodes selected. Anyway, sorry if it wasn't the best example. I think we have a transportation right over here. Yes. All right, we got Leo. Uh, we have the option to bargain. Okay, rings are good. Rings are very good. If that ring has a suffix unveil, we're going to be very happy. So let's take a look. It actually has a prefix unveil because it's triple suffix. So prefix actually has two good things. Prefix, I believe, has increased damage. And I believe it also has life regen. Uh, there is a mechanic where you could block. So because we only have one prefix, which is the unveil, you could actually craft a prefix to prevent from unveiling another prefix. That's a little complicated. We're not going to talk about that. We are hoping to unveil increased damage here. So we actually got it. 23% increased damage. So now we just got a ring that has 23% increased damage. We can craft life on it. It already has a dex roll and a resistance. That ring is good for quite a while, right? Keep your eyes sharp. Cool winds. Let's go take that back and I'll just show you a quick example of what I mean. Now we just go over here and we craft life and look at that ring that's not that bad at all right not too shabby now once you click that unveil you essentially acquire that forever now there are some niche things like for example to unveil increased damage you do need a leo ring right but this is stuff that you will slowly start to learn over time it's not a super big deal right away Okay, and then the last one, we have a bonus, right? Number 11, actually, is the Juggernaut Unbreakable Ascendancy. Now, I'm not going to break out the math or anything, but essentially, Unbreakable is the newest Ascendancy for Juggernaut. Uh, what it does is it essentially gives us, the previous old one was the double body armor, but we now get 8% of your armor here applies to fire, cold, and lightning damage taken from hits. Keyword, hits. This means it works against elemental attacks and elemental spells. It does not work against damage over time, but we are an RF build. We have a lot of regeneration already. We can just move away from the damage over time. Unbreakable is so insane as a defensive layer, I would compare it to block and spell suppression. Now, obviously, if you put block or spell suppression on a jug, you will be even more tanky, but typically on juggernauts, we don't have survivability issues. We have damage issues. So as an example here, I like to compare it to, uh, as Inquisitor, Inquisitor needs to go uh, essentially glancing blows, block cap, so that's 75 block, 75 spell block, and get recovery to be able to somewhat match what Unbreakable has. 
I think Unbreakable is an insane node. It's one of the coolest additions to Jug. It really, in my opinion, gives the Juggernaut a new identity of really just being thick. All right, that's pretty much about it. I hope that the video helped you guys out. Let me know if it did. Let me know if it didn't. If you think there's anything else I should include in the future, please let me know. Anyway, I'm going to catch you guys all later. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget you can catch me streaming live every day at twitch.tv slash pox. See you guys all tomorrow.